Hello, CPPCon. I'm Paul Licamelli, and for the last five years, I have been one of many contributors around the world to this free open source audio recording and editing application called Audacity. which began 20 years ago at Carnegie Mellon University and since then has attracted many users and is now downloaded over tens of millions of times annually. That figure is cumulative only since March of 2015 when it moved to a new hosting site. So I'm a bit of a latecomer to the project. It was popular already without me, but I've had some fun doing various things and here are just some of them. Uh, the first two of those earned me a place on the development team with full commit rights and since then, I, meet, I have even been elected to take a turn as release manager, although I'm not in that capacity now. And as you see at the upper right, my projects have included not only new features, but also modernization initiatives and code cleanups. I persuaded the team to take the leap up to C++11, and then I went through the code and comprehensively eliminated naked news and deletes, among other things, in favor of smart pointers. How much code? About 280,000 lines at a recent count, and that's with all the blanks in the comments. Not gigantic, not tiny either. But I do not want to talk about modern C++ idioms for the remainder. You know where to learn about them, and you know why they're important. But they are small-scale matters of code quality. Large-scale matters of code quality are really an independent dimension. The principles here are not modern. They're classical, they're perennial, and not really tied to any particular language. And they were all excellently stated in 1996 in this book by John Lakos, one of the speakers at CPPCon, and he's here. Um, and John emphasizes good uh, physical design as well as logical. Logical design is all about functions and classes. Plenty of books tell you about that. Physical design is about components, roughly speaking, compilation units that should be of reasonable size and have non-cyclic dependencies among them. Keeping their dependencies non-cyclic is important for several reasons, such as these. John emphasizes the bottom-up incremental unit testing strategy. Of course, it makes the whole more comprehensible for your own team and for also any new recruits who are trying to understand it. Um, anyone? <laughs> and um, also, I would say, would make possible non-monolithic deployment, breaking up the program into a core and also uh, drop-in libraries implementing features so that you might have a... Um, you, you might reassemble binary libraries in a folder and have a reduced or an enhanced version of the product just by restarting it, not rebuilding, and maybe even independent release cycles. But to get there, first I have to understand the accumulated dependencies we've got after 20 years and do something about it. And uh, to do that, I wrote a little tool to assist me, and I want to share that tool with you. The tool uses GraphViz on the back end, which uh, you may know is a free software program that compiles descriptions in a language called dot, such as on the left, into pictures, such as on the right. So it ought to be a cinch to write a Perl script that would find my include directives and generate a dot intermediate, right? Well, um, this is an unhelpful picture. I don't know if this is well-structured stuff or not. There's overwhelming detail. You see a magnification there. So I had to do a little more work to simplify the picture, which took a couple hundred lines of Perl and a couple afternoons of fun. Uh, first, I find strongly connected components of that graph by a lovely textbook algorithm, squash them down to a quotient graph, which is necessarily free of cycles, and furthermore, remove redundant edges, shortcuts like from A to C. What's on the right retains complete and correct information about all transitive dependencies implied on the left, but only that information, which gives me this, Clear as mud picture. <laughs> I say clear as mud because it is a clear picture of what's known as a big ball of mud. Or monolith or tangle, choose your metaphor. So huh, my task is to break that up, but it looks overwhelming. Where do I start? Well, there's more to the script, though, because it also writes a trace to standard error of that algorithm, which retains the complete information about direct dependencies, which the picture doesn't show you. So if I want to know why component A is in a cycle with component B when they shouldn't, I can study that output, I can figure out what the links in the chain are, I can figure out where the surprising one is, and then I can f find some, some uh, code transformation to apply. 
those transformations weren't always easy. There were many techniques, and I could fill up many talks with that. I'm showing you every 50 commits or so during the release in progress. I got this far before code freeze. Thank you for listening. Find the script there at GitHub, apply it to your project too, and let me know if it helps you too. Thank you.